Welcome to a special edition of Brewbound's Brew Talk series brought to you by Dogfish Head Craft Brewery. My name is Justin Kindle, and I'm the editor of Brewbound, and we are coming to you live from my studio apartment in Watertown, Massachusetts. I want to thank you all for joining us right now because, let's face it, it's tough out there. We were all supposed to be sharing beers three weeks ago, or three, three weeks from now at this event in San Antonio, Texas, at the Craft Brewers Conference. But like pretty much everything, that event got canceled and you're stuck here day drinking in my living room with me. So we're gonna talk about the COVID-19 outbreak and the way craft brewers and retailers are navigating this moment, which is quite possibly the most challenging headwind the beer industry and the hospitality industry have ever faced. In a matter of three weeks, on and own premise sales evaporated in an effort to, sl to slow the spread and just outright stop it. Thousands of jobs in our industry, millions in this country have been lost. I've heard from multiple brewers who have said they are in survival mode. So I know we may not have all the answers right now, especially without a vaccine for the novel coronavirus. But we're all here today with the goal of illuminating the issues the industry is facing, as well as trying to learn from each other on how to best navigate this challenging moment. So we all hopefully come out on the other end stronger for it. We have two panel discussions today. Our first one is going to feature dog representatives from Dogfish Head, Denizens Brewing Company, The Winking Lizard, and Total Wine. Our second panel is gonna feature the leaders of the three industry trade groups, the Brewers Association, the Beer Institute, and the NBWA. So let's jump right into this. Let's get our first panel up here. Joining me today is Sam Caligioni, co-founder of Dogfish Head Craft Brewery. Sam, thanks for joining us. Awesome to be here, Justin. We've got John Lane, the co-owner of the Winking Lizard restaurant and tavern chain in Ohio. John, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Also joining us is Matt Bardill, director of Beer for Total Wine and More. Thanks for thanks. hopping in here, Matt. Thanks for having me. And finally joining us is Julie Verratti, the, one of the co-founders of Denizens Brewing Company in Maryland. I know all of you are busy. I appreciate you taking time out to do this panel. So let's just jump right in here. And I, I wanna know how this, how this, uh, I, I guess this crisis that we're all in has affected your businesses. And, and I'm gonna start with Sam. You've closed your pubs, you've closed your inn, but what are the larger ramifications beyond that that you're facing? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks, Justin. So, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about our retail locations a little bit later. Uh, for now, just sticking to distributed sort of uh, portfolio sales, you know, across all of our, our brands and all of our channels. Just looking at IRI uh, data, you know, year to date, the Boston beer portfolio is up 40%, but we're actually up 55, 0% in the last four weeks. We think a lot of that is due to, you know, off premise pantry loading impact, which I think we're, we're a lot of our brethren across the industry are seeing. And then specifically for dogfish uh, in that same data set from IRI, we're about 13% up uh, across our portfolio with Sequench and Slightly Mighty leading as growth brands. Uh, I think we're definitely uh, have a lot of uh, folks that are in a similar position to us where we see retailers, distributors, and consumers leaning into core beers, flagship beers, uh, sort of, you know, the security blanket uh, approach in a moment where you're maybe not as inclined to take a risk on a brand because every day is a risk as we navigate this. So going back to something that gives you comfort and gives you joy. Uh, and I think we're seeing that with our portfolio as we're seeing our retail partners uh, kind of tighten up the SKUs, but do higher volume drops of the sort of uh, the, the, the power SKUs uh, in, our, in our portfolio. And I'd follow up and say, what's the morale like right now at Dogfish Head and Boston Beer? And, and I guess second half of that would be, what do you and Mariah even tell some of the people who are your coworkers right now? Some people who have been with you for some more than 20 years. 
uh, we, you know, we, we, we say we are the Boston Beer Company and together we are heavy. Uh, you know, we're people first and product second. So our, our single biggest, uh, you know, priority is the safety of our coworkers, whether it's the majority of us that are working remotely from the safety of our homes and the challenges and, and you know, uh, unexpected things that come up in family life when you're working from home or our brave coworkers at our production facilities uh, we make sure first and foremost, it's about safety. And then we remind them we made it through uh, the first craft beer shakeout in the late 90s together as, as, a, as a family of coworkers. We made it through the uh, 08 uh, downturn, 9-11. These are going to be challenges, but we're going to have all the confidence that the, the great minds at our company will figure out a way to get through this challenge as we have those we've uh, faced for over, over 30 years. Julie, uh, Denizens operates a pair of tap rooms and brew pubs in the Maryland, D.C. area. How much of your business was basically taken from you overnight and what moves have you made to uh, adjust in response? Yes, yeah, so we have uh, two brew pub locations as, uh, and one of them actually serves as a production facility. So our business model has actually been kind of a hybrid where we're a production brewery. We send beer out into distribution and then we operate the two uh, brew pub, tap room, restaurants um, in the two locations. So, uh, you know, we shut down in person dining and drinking at those locations on March 16th. Um, we really saw kind of the writing on the wall coming up to that day. Uh, the, the sales just sort of were dropping steadily every day. Um, and we decided that Sunday that we were going to just close them to the public. Um, and that's obviously a huge chunk of our revenue in terms of. Uh, where we make most of our margins, as well as the you know, the business that we bring in, um, the governor also announced that same day that he was shutting down in-person dining. So even if we hadn't decided that, had decided at that point it was going to happen anyway. Um, and from there, you know, we just moved to a sort of like a takeout curbside, plus pivoted immediately to doing direct-to-consumer beer deliveries. Um, we still sell our food through Uber Eats. Um, we've been a partner with them for over a year now. Um, so we're still doing Uber Eats. We're still doing beer deliveries. That's one of the biggest ways that we've pivoted. Um, I will tell you that, you know, more than half of our wholesale business dropped because people aren't buying kegs right now. We are in the lucky position that we own our own canning line and we do package beer and customers of ours on the wholesale side that um, need, need the products, um, we're able to get them beer. Um, but yeah, we've, we've had to pivot pretty hard and the, the beer deliveries directly to consumers has been kind of our lifeline um, during this whole thing. Uh, how long can that sustain denizens and how steady have those sales been or have they ebbed and flowed? Um, I have no idea how long it can, it can sustain us, to be honest with you. Um, it is a lot of work. Uh, it is sustaining us right now. Um, we're able to keep 10 people still fully employed, employed and still getting their salaries. Uh, while we're able to sort of, I mean, we basically created a direct-to-consumer delivery and logistics company in 48 hours and have had a lot of learning curves through that. And I feel comfortable with the systems we set up now. Um, it, it is sustaining us and bringing in cash so we can continue to employ people, continue to operate. Um, you know, no one knows how long this is going to last. Um, mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to the day when we can open our doors again and hopefully um, go back to some sort of norm normalcy, but who knows what that's even going to look like. I, I can tell you the Denizens Brewing Company that closed their doors on March 16th is not going to be the same Denizens Brewing Company when we reopen our doors in however many months from now. Uh, do you have any idea what that looks like yet? I mean, we're, we're having internal conversations day to day and sort of looking at, you know, how do we be more efficient? How do we tighten uh, where we can? You know, how do we, you know, we created this whole new delivery service and who knows if the, the regulators are going to allow that to continue. I think it's going to be really difficult to put the toothpaste back into the tube uh, when consumers have gotten used to having beer delivered directly to them. Um, you know, that's, that could be something, who knows, we'll see what, what the rules are. Hey puppy. <laughs> yeah, I know. Sorry, I can see your dog my, in the back. Yeah, <laughs> my dog Dusty Rhodes, uh, the American Dream, might make a cameo during this Brew Talks event. I mean, we're here for two hours, and he's not going to sit still. So, <laughs> sorry. Uh, that's okay. Yeah, um, I mean, we'll 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 see. I mean, and honestly, it's anyone's guess what things are going to look like after this crisis. 
Right. John, the Winking Lizard operates 18 restaurants, beer bars in Ohio. You've made some very difficult decisions uh, during this crisis, um, temporarily closing those locations and laying off your staff. Can you walk us through those decisions and give us a, a picture of what the future for the Winking Lizard might look like? Sure. Um, so we, uh, on March 15th, the governor announced at 3.30 in the afternoon that um, all bars and restaurants had to close down except for a carryout business, effective nine o'clock that night. So we literally had um, less than six hours to make some uh, critical decisions. Uh, I have two partners and we immediately got on the phone uh, with each other and um, not knowing how long this was going to last was, I guess, the hardest thing coming out of it right off the bat. But uh, we knew we were going to have to make some hard decisions. So we, I know I got right in my car and went down to our Macedonia store because that's the one I ran for 10 years. And we got a flood of customers coming in to get their last beer. And um, right then it was really hard for me to even look at my employees because I knew what we were going to have to do. And um, the next morning we announced that we were going to laying off 99% uh, of our hourly team, which is about 1,100 employees. I will say that I cannot believe what troopers they were um, and how they understood why we had to do what we were doing. And um, I think it was good communication through our hot schedules messaging, through our social media. I love my lizard page that, you know, we've got to, the end all is no matter what, we've got to save the company because if we don't, we're going to have 1,300 people out of work when this is all over with. So um, we laid off all the hourlies on Monday. Uh, we decided to keep uh, and we closed down three stores immediately, the ones that don't do a lot of carry out business. We got our managers and uh, in the stores and we said we want to keep them gainfully employed. Again, not knowing how long this was going to last so that uh, we had the infrastructure in place that uh, we could um, reopen as soon as the governor told us we'd be able to reopen. The problem is, is our restaurants are big. And um, so you'd have three managers literally in the back of the house opening, getting the food prepped, doing the carry out, and then cleaning up at the end. And um, that's tough and really tough, hard work. And then the front of the house guys are taking care of everything in the front, had to reorganize how people pick up, you know, the social distancing, et cetera. So we um, lasted for a uh, couple of weeks and we were getting ready to make some more hard decisions when the um, CARE Act was passed by Congress. And it kind of made up our minds um, because uh, the feds were adding $600 to uh, unemployment benefits in Ohio. It's roughly about half of what you make, you get back in unemployment. And you know we felt a social responsibility to keep our managers uh, busy because half is a bitter swallow to, uh, pill to, uh, to swallow. And so we, we, it made us e it easier. Our managers were beat, they were tired and knowing that they were gonna um, have some comfort knowing that they're gonna uh, be able to make most of them about 80, 85% of what they're making now uh, on unemployment, which is still a hard, hard bitter pill to swallow. That's rough. Now we have, um, we have four, employees on payroll, our director of HR, three people in accounting, but uh, two of the accountants will go off the payroll after this week. And um, we will have just two employees on payroll until we get reopened. So how do you even plan for the future at this point? Well, uh, you know, I like to say, you know, we built this thing in 38 years and it all came crashing down in two weeks. So, you know, that's a really good question. But I will tell you, 12 or 15 years ago, we might not have made it through. But, you know, as you get older, you figure out you better have a pretty good nest egg. And, um, you know, we made those hard decisions in the beginning to save that cash so that uh, when they make uh, the determination we can open, um, we're going we're gonna to be pretty good to go. We have great landlords, contacted all our landlords. 
everyone deferred our, our rent payments uh, for a couple of months. And so when you have no labor, you have no product coming in, and then you don't have any rent, that's about 80% of um, you know, your, your fixed expenses. And so um, we're gonna be able to fight another day. That's good to hear. Uh, Matt, uh, we've seen an explosion in the off-premise sales, um, all segments up. And that, that's not a perception, that's reality of what's happening. Brands that have been down for years are, are getting a second life. How have sales at Total Wine been over the last two to three weeks? What would you compare those to? Yeah, I, I mean, really how to compare them to would be, you know, kind of a similar situation for the people on the East Coast and like Hurricane Alley is kind of what you know, what happens when, you know, a hurricane is kind of scheduled to hit the Eastern Seaboard. So you have a, you know, a, a panic moment or a stock up moment um, that, you know, that we definitely saw starting March, March 13th is kind of where we had that moment where we had like 120% increase in foot traffic and 200% in uh, sales that day. And at that point, we were like, okay, that's the initial surge. So how are we going to, you know, how are we going to kind of respond to it? And so obviously when you have that kind of sales lift over several you know, days um, and, you know, again, good sales growth over weeks, you know, we had to quickly figure out how we're going to handle this thing. Cause this is a, you know, this, you know, a public safety issue that we're dealing with that, you know, a whole, the whole reason is we want to make sure that we get through this thing safely. Um, so, you know, we had to pivot pretty quick and say, okay, no tastings in our stores, no classroom events in our stores. That's the kind of a backbone of what we do, like off premise is get the liquid the lips to get people to try the various um, um, products that we have. You know, then we had this thing where, you know, we have a, we have a digital, a but, it's called a, a budding digital um, platform and baseline, but it wasn't able to basically hold that initial rush. So we actually had to stop delivery and stop in-store pickup a couple of days there just to make sure that we could actually get through all the customers that we had in our stores and make sure we didn't create any kind of issues with, you know, overcrowding or whatnot. And, you know, the, another thing we had to do when our quick response is to make sure that the environment's safe. I mean, when you have something like COVID-19, you know, you, you got to step back and say safety first for everybody, for our employees, for our partners, and for our customers. So, you know, that's getting social distancing signage up. That's making sure people are standing, you know, six feet apart in line, um, getting gloves um, to all of our stores as quickly as we can possibly could. Um, metering particular stores. We have, you know, a situation where, you know, we have that many people we need to meter, make sure we're not causing, you know, actually increasing the problem. You know, then, you know, we kind of went to a third stage of like recovery. And that was when we were able to hire 1500 people in two weeks to help us get through this um, surge and this kind of shift of business that we're going through. And the shift, I'm, you know, again, in-store traffic is up, but also the big shift is digital and what that means, you know, the in-store pickup um, and how that we have to now shift there, you know, opening, you know, getting people in at 5 a.m. to pick, or to pick orders um, from five until the store's open. Um, allowing wholesalers actually to deliver earlier. So then we can limit, again, limit the number of people that are in the building for safety to keep everybody safe and the environment as safe as possible. And I think that that's, you know, we've gotten, that's kind of a, the fourth stage that we're in. It's like a big shift. And now we got to figure out, you know, okay, what is, once we get through this, you know, kind of what, what Julie was saying, it's going to be different, right? It, it's going to be interesting. We don't have answers yet, but we're starting to figure out, okay, hey, let's start, you know, projecting and, you know, figuring out, let's, you know, do some scenario planning of what's going to be the new normal, if you will, after this all ends. What can't you keep on shelves right now? And don't say dogfish head or denizens just because they're Julie and <laughs> Sam are on the call. No, uh, <laughs> I would say, you know, I think that I will give kudos to the supply chain. A lot of it. I mean, again, we can talk about reasons like the on-premise had a lot of, you know, them closing down, John, it's, it really hurts them. Um, but in general, we've had a pretty good response from inventory perspective where we've actually, with the increased demand that we've had, we've been able to keep our stores stocked. I would say that, you know, there is an uptick um, in larger packages across all um, categories, whether that be craft, um, big brewery or high volume imports. I think that's, again, a trend that we're seeing overall. It's that stock up. But also, 
you know, the domestic premiums, I think they, you know, kind of, they came back a little bit as well um, from where they had been. But, you know, again, hard sales are still there too. And I think that's another thing too, is that that trend hasn't stopped. And I think that's another, it's another evidence that that trend is probably here to stay for a good period of time at this point. Uh, I want to remind our viewers right now, you can send questions in, email us at ask at brewbound.com. That's ask at brewbound.com. And you can also text us 617-336-8560. That's 617-336-8560. Uh, I, I want to get to a question about, well, I, I guess we don't have a lot of answers right now. And knowing that, though, I wonder if each of you can share one you know, necess necessity is the mother of invention example that hopefully our audience members can learn from today and p potentially apply to their own businesses. Um, and I'll start with Sam. I is there something along those lines, some piece of advice, something you've learned in this moment that you can share with the audience? Sam, you're, you're muted. Are you? Can you hear you, me now? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, good. So, I mean, I think getting up every day and the, and the, the news cycle changes by the moment. Uh, you know, I recognize for a lot of us in the industry, every day is like a, a Sisyphean task where you're rolling this, this boulder up a hill and then there's something else that pushes you back every day that you didn't expect. But the way, you know, we're approaching it at Dogfish is, and at Boston Beer is you try to make three little baby steps every day. And the first one is, how do I keep my coworkers and myself safe today? Uh, the second one I would say is, how do I do something that helps my community uh, through this moment? And then the third would be, how can I make a baby step forward for our company today? And most days in this moment, you might only get one or two of those steps, but uh, that's what gives you hope when you make those steps forward. I'd say for us, necessity becoming the mother of invention would be, uh, you know, the uh, for us, the recognition that we knew on premise was going to be hit hardest at the same kind of moment within days of us also knowing that because we have a, a sizable distillery, we had the raw capabilities to make a, a high volume of hand sanitizer. So it's the first time in the history of our company we took a product from concept to delivering it, you know, fully label approved by the FDA in less than a week to get hand sanitizer to our local hospitals. And we thought it would only be our own coworkers that needed it, but the governor reached out to us. Uh, and soon we were, they became our biggest customers. 100% of the profits from our hand sanitizer sales go to a fund that Mariah and I, through the Beer and Benevolence uh, Fund that we have established to create financial relief for hospitality workers uh, in our state, uh, and we funded that as well with a fifty thousand uh, dollar donation, and we'll match that with another fifty thousand dollar donation. And in synchronicity with our other brands, Sam Adams is super active on uh, uh, the Restaurant Strong program, which is now we've put over two hundred million or two hundred thousand into that. It's impacting twenty states. Uh, John Lane mentioned that he shared that with his his uh, employees, which is exciting to see it gain traction. Uh, state by state. Um, so, you know, keeping our people safe first, as I said, is the first thing when you come to one of our facilities, everyone uh, has to get their temperature checked on the way in. We've dislocated shift changes. So there's not even that changing of the guard happening with people uh, next to each other, face masks for all production people. So it starts with the concentric circles from take care of safety, health first, then your community, and then worry about business and profitability is the way that we're, we're navigating it. How about you, Julie? Um, so I, the question was sort of what, what have you innovated? What, you what type of learning could you maybe share that worked for you in this moment that maybe someone else can apply to their business right now? Sure. Um, I don't know if there's anything very specific, like do this and you'll get, you know, this as a result. But I will say just generally speaking, uh, you know, we had to pivot immediately, just like every other business right now across this country. Um, so don't be afraid to make a decision and then change your mind an hour later and pivot again. Um, you know, we started delivering direct to consumers on Sunday, March 15th. 
and we've changed our entire system up and down in less than three weeks uh, because we realized certain things are working, certain things weren't, and we're now at a place where we're way more efficient on it. Um, and it's allowing our um, folks that are still on staff to still keep working, but also not be working 16 hour days. Um, so that we're, again, going to Sam's point about taking care of your staff, taking care of your employees and making sure that they're safe, they're healthy. Um, and then obviously making sure our customers are also safe and healthy and still being able to get the products to them. Um, I think that, you know, these are unprecedented times and people need to be all of the old rules of what we used to do need to be thrown out and we need to just be doing everything we can right now um, as a company, um, as a, as an industry to try to pivot and make sure we survive on the other side of this. We had a question come in and somebody asked when you're running for public office, Julie. <laughs> well, uh, I already did that once and I got my ass kicked. Um, <laughs> I did run for Lieutenant Governor of Maryland in 2018 um, and didn't work out. Uh, I will always be engaged in uh, talking with public officials as well as my community. Um, I'm very loud. I have a lot of opinions and I don't mind sharing those thoughts with folks. But thank you for the question. <laughs> John, uh, anything that you've learned in this that you know you might tell other retailers on how, how you've handled this that maybe they can apply to their business? Yeah, um, I always like to say we're in the people business first and the restaurant business second. Um, in fact, over 150 of our employees have worked for us over 10 years, which for on-premise retail, I think is pretty awesome. And um, communication was key um, through all avenues. And I think the, you know, making the hard decision that, um, you know, keeping people on and try to struggle and still writing checks every week is not gonna do us all any good if we have to keep doing this for 10 weeks and all of a sudden we can't come back another day and we're laying, you're permanently laying off people. So making them understand um, that, you know, we're, we're making these hard decisions so that we can come back. And, uh, and I think we're gonna be stronger than ever. I think um, a lot of our brethren are not gonna be in the same boat. Um, I've already seen lots of numbers from NRA, National Restaurant Association, and, um, you know, we're going to be one of those standing, um, but there's going to be a lot that are not. Yeah. Matt, uh, for the local and small, smaller craft brewers who are heading into this spring and summer, summer month, um, I, I guess we're heading into that period. Is there any advice you can share with them about how they can find it, find success with Total Wine? Yeah, I think that, you know, throughout this, you know, we've always supported local. Um, we've always supported newness and we always supported trends at Total Wine. That's what basically differentiates us, um, you know, in all of our products, but in particular beer. And I think that's not going to change. It hasn't changed. If anything, it's going to grow stronger um, from, from what we have. So I think that it's, you know, we're here for them. Um, we continue to support local. Um, I can tell you there's been a couple people, you know, a couple breweries in various parts of the country that hadn't been, um, you know, there's been a keg business, right? And then, you know, this this kind of forced them to go cans and, you know, we were more than what we're ready to, you know, have them have their cans in our stores. And I think that that's, you know, one of those things that, you know, it's, we always have been, we haven't stopped. Now I will say, you know, full transparency, we, you know, my team didn't stop adding new items um, or looking at new local breweries, but, you know, there was a time back when I was talking about, you know, a week or two ago, and we had that, you know, a spike in sales. We had to kind of hold off on bringing new items in for that week, um, you know, and adding retail to that week for those new items, just so we can make sure that we had the right experience, like I said earlier, for the stores and for the safety of our customers. But I can tell you that this week, you know, we're back to normal adding uh, initial retails and new items to our to all of our sets and all of our stores. I mean, that's kind of how we operate, and that's not going to stop um, now. We're getting a couple of questions with people wanting to know when when the on premise does return. Um, for Sam and Julie, are you planning on discounting kegs uh, when that returns? Julie, you want to go first? Uh, sure. Um, you know, I ha we haven't even gotten to the point where we've even started that conversation. Um, I do think that there's going to be 
the entire industry up and down every single tier, I think is going to be impacted by this um, for a much longer term than just the immediate uh, sequence of events that are going on right now. Um, I think another issue um, to think about too is what happens to all the beer that is in that are in kegs right now. Um, the, the beer is going to go is going to spoil because it's going to go out of code. Sort of what are we doing um, to help the entire tier, uh, all three tiers go through that? I know that the Brewers Association is working really really hard right now in their efforts to lobby Congress. Um, to really push for a spoiled beer tax credit, which I think will enable, you know, tier one as a manufacturing level to be able to take that credit and then hopefully pass that down through the tiers. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a very good question and it's something that, you know, with everything going on, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna take that question and add it to my list of things that <laughs> me and Emily and Jeff need to talk about internally uh, about what we're gonna be able to do. Sam, we've seen several companies offer to either eat or split the cost to buy back uh, old kegs of beer. What do you see as the best approach to handling that? Well, I think the, the first thing we, you know, at Boston Beer, Dogfish, you know, what we're cho choosing to do is spend a lot of our philanthropic efforts to help the on-premise with establishing these funds, whether it's the one, you know, Beer and Benevolence we established here at Delaware, Restaurant Strong, which we developed uh, through Sam Adams, which is more about getting people uh, back to work. I also think we got to be really conscious that this, this, this to go slash takeout slash delivery world we're living in on premise right now, instead of focusing on so much on what, what's going to happen when everything gets open right now, we got to be really thoughtful about how do we do this new world order for as long as it takes. Cause it could frankly take months. And you know, our, our on-premise leader, Hempy, gave a great example, which I, I asked him, so what are some examples nationally of people doing really ambitious, interesting entrepreneurial things to make money in this moment when their on-premise businesses can't happen in their building? I like the inventive stuff uh, Julie and her partners are doing. And, he's, and he gave the great example of, you can't just hang a flag outside and say, I'm open, come by and, and buy something to go or come to my curb. This is when you need to market that you're open uh, proactively through social media, through digital, through wherever your platforms are. But that marketing should start with showing how thoughtful you are for safety considerations as you're keeping that component of your of your business open. So I'm looking forward to the moment when we can put our plan into place about what we're going to do when we open our locations. Like we'll probably extend our food specials discounts through the summer uh, to help people that we know probably don't have as much income as usual at our hotel we'll probably market more to the mid-atlantic than nationally knowing that the aviation industry is probably going to be under pressure for a good year uh, more people are going to do more local vacations so we're thinking about that stuff but right now we're trying to you know buy from our on-premise accounts uh our food for our co-workers going out and supporting those that are brave enough to stay open and we're staying in this moment uh for now before we think about Re reopening our own retail locations. For the keg beer that is still in code, um, we, we've gotten some questions about what's the best way to handle that. W what would your suggestion be, Julie? Sorry, I'd unmute myself. Um, <laughs> for the ones that haven't gone on, I mean, I know that there are lots of on-premise places, at least in uh, Maryland, DC, and Virginia right now, who are still doing takeout curbside pickup. Um, if folks have your kegs, uh, you know, we have actually had a couple of places buy kegs from us in the last week or two. Um, these are folks we self-distribute to because they're they're using that beer to put into growlers and, you know, sell those to go. Or some of these places have crowler machines and they're packaging them in crowlers and selling those to go for their customers. Um, I'm, anything that you can do to try to support them. You know, we've had a lot of uh, on-premise places reach out to us and say, hey, you know, we've never needed to use growlers before. Do you happen to have any extra growlers we could get from you? Um, and, you know, trying to help where we can with that. And then also making sure that we're sharing all of the, you know, the vendors that we use as well. Um, and sort of giving advice on, well, we know that these guys don't have a large minimum for ordering. We know these guys have the best price. If you do, you know, just trying to help people out to get them access to the materials they need. John, uh, we've heard President Trump uh, propose a restaurant de deduction um, for to help out the hospitality industry. 
would that benefit the Winking Lizard? And what assistance does a regional restaurant chain like yours need uh, the most in this moment? Well, I'm, there's a couple of things and absolutely that would help. I mean, that's, I think anything you can help a uh, business to defray expense and then in, in turn, you know, that's gonna help us uh, getting those business customers to spend money is, is a great thing. Um, I think there's a couple of things in the state of Ohio, we don't have credit, so it's all COD. And I think um, if you think about it, this thing's going on and, you know, our part of, of the freshness is, yeah, we're going to have to pour a lot of uh, beer down the drain and we're going to have to get a, get a lot of, get rid of a lot of packaged beer. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a lot of restocking and a lot of inventory. Um, I know that the state of Ohio is already exploring on the spirit side um uh talking uh about giving credit you know on the initial order for 30 days i think anything that we could do to to help that way would be great i have talked to a couple of breweries um and they're talking about doing a special package just for the on-premise maybe some one-offs um again um one one uh brewery is talking about doing a hundred dollar keg something special one-off just for on-premise that we can charge normal margin just to because uh, I think we just need we need to just get our be able to get our feet off the ground. Um, Matt, it, is your phone ringing off the hook right now with uh, breweries wanting in? Yeah, that, that, I mean, it. like I said before, it, we always are very open. But yes, there are definitely opportunities that have come to us that, um, you know, that we haven't been able to, you know, we, that we've a, either had a great relationship and that we can make a bigger like you know, our store out in Colorado, you know, works very well with Weldworks, right? And so having this solution for them, I think this all happened right before they were going to have their, I apologize, it was an anniversary. So it was one of their anniversaries. You know, they had you know, brewed all the beer. And, you know, then you have a situation where, you know, their, their you know, tap room, brew pub gets closed down. So where are they going to put that beer? So, you know, our my local team has been, you know, working with them to figure out, hey, how do we do this, you know? We were able to get, I mean, places like the Alchemist was able to, you know, they're just shipping some stuff down into the off-premise world in Massachusetts, you know, something that doesn't happen that often as well. So I think that's, you know, those are the opportunities um, along with the local partners that we always have had. How do we strengthen that relationship at this point um, is another thing that, you know, my team as well, the team, my teams in the field are, are working really hard to do. Julie, you've been very vocal about the, the needs of small businesses uh, during this crisis. Uh, we've seen three relief stimulus packages passed, and there's talk of a fourth coming. Are you getting the assistance you need, and what more needs to be done? Um, well, I'll say that it shouldn't just be talk of a fourth. There needs to be a fourth. There needs to be a fifth. There needs to be a sixth. There probably needs to be a seventh all the way up until we are able to get to the other side of this thing. Um, they've got to keep trying to fix it until it's completely fixed. Um, you know, I think some of the programs that have come out in the CARES Act, um, there are some positive things. I'll say the number one, the one that I, I think is the most positive that was part of the CARES Act is the automatic six months forgiveness for any business who had a SBA backed guaranteed loan prior to COVID happening. Um, that's a that's huge. Uh, SBA loans are expensive. Um, the fees that you pay to get those loans in the first place are more expensive than regular commercial loans. So having those six months of payments be not just deferred, but actually forgiven that you never have to pay those again is almost like making up for all those <laughs> high fees that you had to pay for in the first place. And it also helps with cash retention. The two things that small businesses need right now are cash retention and cash infusion. And so if people in office are creating programs, they need to be looking at those two things as the end goal. Is what I'm creating right now going to allow for more retention of cash in small businesses, or is what I'm doing right now going to allow for an infusion of cash for these businesses? The government shut businesses down. People have been laid off across this country. You know, the numbers came out today. I think 10 million people have filed for unemployment across this country as of today. I think it's going to continue to rise. Um, the government needs to step in and do as much intervention as they possibly can. Uh, the things that I think Congress can do right away is create, a, a, make a, a mandated moratorium on all commercial debt payments, a mandated moratorium on all commercial rent payments, and a mandated moratorium on all commercial 
mortgage payments. And you got to do all three of those at once. We can't just stop people from having to pay rents, but still make landlords still have to pay their mortgages. It has to be both of those things at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot more they can do. I think that unemployment needs to be increased even more. Uh, you know, any program that's being created, the paperwork needs to be as reduced as possible. You know, folks are scrambling, working 16 hour days, just trying to survive right now. Um, driving or, you know, me personally, I've been working 16 hour days straight since the start of this thing. I have not, I'm barely sleeping, I'm barely eating. I mean, I will say one of the silver linings I've had is I've lost like 10 pounds in the last two weeks because I'm not eating as much as I used to. Um, you know, it's, you know, it, but it's extremely stressful and folks don't have the time to be sitting down, reading through all of these bills, reading through all of these new rules and trying to decipher a, okay, what does this even mean? B, is this the right program for me? And then C, actually filling out the paperwork to apply for all of these things. So I just, I urge that our government and, their, and all of the elected officials, and if you're watching this, please contact your elected officials on every level, local, state, federal, we all have to do it. We all have to be telling our stories to folks who are in office, who are making these decisions. They don't necessarily know what it's like to run a small business day to day. Some of them do, but a lot of them don't. And it's our job as citizens to explain what that experience is like so that we can come together and create policy solutions that will actually help us. So. We're, we're getting quite a bit of questions into, and I'll try to get to as many of these as I can. Uh, one of the things that keeps coming up is people want to know what the on-premise looks like when it returns. And I know we don't have a whole lot of answers right now, but how, how are each of you planning to bring people back to your establishments? Uh, I'll start with Sam. Yeah, you know, I mentioned that we're already talking about uh, extending our food specials that usually run in the off season since we're a seasonal resort area and run them right through, you know, the summer potentially. Uh, to recognize that folks might not have as much spare change in their pocket uh, when they come to visit. And we're planning our regional marketing uh, more, we're planning our marketing more, more regionally right now, thinking that a lot of folks that do come to the resort area when we make the bulk of our revenue in our retail locations will likely be doing shorter jaunts uh, for their vacation and staying uh, closer to home. Um, so those are two ways that we know we're doing it. The other thing is we're installing a, a, a sweet little canning line in our Rehoboth facility to start offering to go four pack, 16 ounce beers, both old school dogfish throwbacks and really innovative beers to entice folks from around the country that do want to take a longer jaunt to know that there's going to be something special that they come and can only get at our locations and that will help our coworkers within our building in terms of tips and revenue uh, as well. John, how do you even think about what your restaurants look like when this comes back? Yeah, um, we've got, uh, my two partners and I have a meeting next week to just discuss that. How, how are we gonna reorganize to come back and what are we gonna look like? You know, are we gonna have a lot less bar stools? Are we gonna have a lot less tables in our restaurants with more distance? which uh, in turn is gonna require less staff. Um, those are like, you know, a lot of questions at the forefront. Um, yes, um, we were already pretty much, you know, uh, advocates of core brands, but um, is that customer gonna want a lot more different? Or are they gonna even, are they gonna come back to more and more to core brands? Are they gonna be more important than ever? A um, lot, lot more questions than answers, that's for sure. Same question for you, Julie, because I've, I've seen some of your tweets about the uncertainty, even with some of this federal assistance, you know, and trying to decide how you come back. So how do you weigh, you know, what de the new denizens looks like, whatever that is, with, you know, health and safety, and mm -hmm. also applying for all the federal assistance that is out there, like payroll pr protection? Um. You know, we're like I said earlier, we are having conversations about what it looks like when we reopen. You know, we're in a lucky position that at least in our Silver Spring location, we have a very open and expansive beer garden, which in the summer months would enable people to be out drinking and keeping distance from each other in a large open air space. 
Um, we're also talking about maybe our food menu is tightened. We don't have quite as many offerings on the menu. Um, thinking about things like do salt and sh pepper shakers even exist anymore after this? Are people going to really want to be, are people going to want to be touching laminated menus? I don't know, probably not, unless they are disinfected in between every single use. So maybe everything goes to paper. Um, these are all the little things that we're thinking about in terms of just even the service model. Um, we want to make sure again that our, our team is is safe. Our you know our our company is protected so that we can continue to employ people and continue to be a community space and a community partner uh, in Maryland. Um, and also making sure that our customers are having a good experience. And again, everything is uncertain right now. You know that's been one of my biggest issues with some of the programs that have come out in this last couple of weeks uh, in the CARES Act specifically is. You know, small businesses are being asked to make long-term financial decisions in terms of deciding what types of money or what types of program they apply to borrow, uh, but they're basing what their revenues might be in a pre-COVID world. So what did your numbers look like in 2019 at this time? Um, how many employees did you have during that time? And then you have to decide whether or not you're going to borrow money and you're what, what is it going to look like in 2020 after, after COVID is done? Nobody has any idea how many folks are going to be coming back to go out to eat at restaurants, at, at on-premise, to drink at bars. It's, it's all a guessing game at this point. Sam, uh, we've seen a number of laws loosened during this emergency um, to allow brewers to sell beer to go, deliver beer, restaurants to sell alcohol to go. Uh, are we seeing the door open to more permanent changes? Well, you know, we, we at, at Dogfish, you know, chose not to open our retail locations to, you know, for, for us, part of that was making sure we're keeping as many people safe as we can. But the other was, you know, our, our production brewery, our production distillery, that's kind of the heart of our economic engine and, and our pubs are important, but we also know that uh, our local restaurateurs, mom and pop restaurateurs, the heart of their business is their restaurants. So we decided to close ours and feed business uh, to them. Um, that said, we're very proud of our tasting room and brew pubs. We look forward to getting them open. They're awesome R&D hubs, brand, uh, brand uh, education hubs. But, you know, and I know Jim Cook and I have both said this for years, you know, 99% of what we sell is through the three-tier system and the craft brewing renaissance in America would not have happened if it weren't for the three-tier system in terms of creating an even playing field for the smallest of brewers to get to retail, as Matt described, how quickly they could act to bring beers that were not traditionally in total into total. Um, you know, that to me is critical. Now, uh, Julie has described that there will be a new world order, and this may be a shameless plug for the next panel we have with Jim from the BI and Craig from NBWA and, and Bob from the Brewers Association, but I have all the confidence in the world that our industry leaders across the three tiers will recognize in this new world order what we do to sort of evolve our business model, but in a way that protects the integrity of our system. Here's a question from the audience. Uh, do you think that pricing will drop across the board for on-premise? Uh, do you think that we'll, we could go back to early 2000s keg prices? Will we move back to $5 craft beer pints for accounts? I'll throw that out. Uh, what do you think, Julie? Um, I mean, my first response to that is if we want to have lower keg prices, we're going to have to take a hard look at the types of beers that are being released right now. I mean, the biggest trend recently has been IPAs, especially hazy IPAs. Um, and, you know, we make a hazy IPA. I'm not saying there's something wrong with that, but those types of beers are really expensive. Um, I see a lot of loggers coming out in the near future. Um, it, it, you know, they're loggers and beers that are not, not as expensive to make. I think, yeah, this is a really good conversation to have. Again, nobody has any idea what things are going to look like, but, you know, having cheaper kegs is certainly going to help our on-premise partners be able to get back open and back on their feet a lot faster and hopefully sustain um, and continue to thrive. I mean, we have to remember this is not a market for shutdown. The market was actually doing really well. This is a pandemic that happened that shut everything down. So I am hopeful that if we can get the right programs in place, 
that we can get the right support in place and we're all working together across all three tiers, we're all gonna make it alive on the other side. And I, I, I'm getting more optimistic by the day. I can't tell if I'm just going through the phases of grief and I'm now at acceptance or if this is a situation where things are actually gonna get better and there are better programs that are being created. We all need to work together across all three tiers to make that happen. Man, I hope you're right. <laughs> I really <laughs> hope you're right. I do too. <laughs> John, uh, I, I guess that same question, uh, how, how will you view this when uh, the Winking Lizard gets back online? Um, yeah, I think, I think our partners have always done right by us. And so I think, you know, I love our capitalist, capitalistic system and I think it's gonna find its way, right? Um, you know, there's, there's gonna be, there's a, a few challenges with that. Um, just because they're given a hundred dollar keg, does that mean that we're still have the rights to sell it for you know six dollars a pint? Is that the right thing to do to our customer? So we got to think about our customer as well, as, as much as you know our livelihood. And we've always been in that value, um, that value place. So um, I th I honestly think I'm hoping that it's a short term thing that we get this thing going again and. Um, the economy goes right back uh, where it was. I mean, I got to be honest, we had the best January and February we've ever had in our 30, going on 38 years of business. And so um, while I know I'm, I'm being optimistic, I'm being op optimistic and I'm being bullish that I think we're going to get this thing back on track. Well, here's another bullish question. Uh this is for Sam and Julie from the audience. Um, someone is thinking about making a large capital investment in a canning line right now to help with the off-premise sales. Uh, should they do it? Sam, you're you're muted again. Oh, Jim, I might need your help. Go to Julie first. <laughs> Thanks, I'm Sam. I'm now unmuted. Am I, am I speaking now? You're speaking. We can oh. hear you. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'd say go for it. Now's, now's the time for confident leadership, uh, you know, as brewers, as distributors, as retailers right now, this time of year traditionally is when we're planning our next year's, uh, commercial plan sales and marketing. And now's, I think not the time to say, Oh, I better not uh, go for it with my, with my planning. You know, I kind of liken this moment to that, uh, the moment, of the last scene in uh, Cormac McCarthy's book, The Road, which paints this picture of this uh, world that's under siege and, you know, it's totally unpredictable, but there's this trout that's swimming up, up upstream with a sense of purpose because it's their nature. And similarly, in our industry, we, we, we are here because we love what we do. We're, we're about growing. And I know that if we stick to our plans, we will get our industry back to growth. So for those entrepreneurs that are wondering if they should go for it, you know, be careful, but uh, go for it. Well, they might come back to you in a, in a few months. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I'm necessarily as uh, bullish as Sam is. Um, I, I would say, I mean, that's obviously like an internal business decision for whichever company is thinking about doing that. If you have the extra cash um, and you can afford to do it, I will say that we can't package beer in cans fast enough right now. I mean, we're packaging four or five days a week. We're brewing double turns multiple days a week. Our production staff is fully employed right now. Um, and a lot of that's because of the, again, direct to consumer sales that we're doing um, through beer deliveries and then also through um, the wholesale customers that we have. Um, we have a couple of wholesalers and we also self-distribute in, in certain jurisdictions. So yeah, if you have the cash, sure, but you also have to remember what's the lead time? Did you already put the deposit down? Is it already being created or is this like you're going to put the money down and you don't get this thing for eight weeks, 12 weeks? Uh, I've got a question for Matt. I want to hit something on e-commerce sales because we've seen a huge uptick with services like Drizzly. Um, is this a moment where consumers are really going to finally ad adopt e-commerce? Is, is Are we at the moment where we finally had the trial, we've gotten so many more new year users doing it, and it's going to take off from here? Yeah, I think there's you know, a couple of things you need to consider. One um, is, yes, they, there are a bunch of customers that are being you know exposed to the 
the digital, you know, whether it be delivery, um, curbside. We just, again, we have, we're, as of tomorrow, we'll have 150 stores that have curbside pickup. Again, before this, this is on the roadmap for 2021, and now we have that. So customers are always going to get exposed to it. Um, I think one of the things that, you know, do I think it's going to continue to, right now we're experiencing, you know, mid 20s, um, high 20s. Uh, digital as our total of our, our total business on, on a given day, you know, before this, it was 6%. So, you know, they've definitely been exposed. They're definitely shifting for, you know, obvious reasons. I think one of the things that will be interesting to see, and Julie kind of hit on it a little bit, is what does like, you know, what do the regulations and look like after we get through this? Like, are we able to continue to, you know, are breweries able to continue to, you know, and be honest, retailers deliver in states where before we couldn't do delivery and we couldn't do that, you know, that piece, which is so critical to the digital. So I think that, you know, do I think it's going to stay, you know, our business going to stay 25, 30%, you know, digital? Probably not. Do I think it's going to go back to six? I don't think that either. I think it's somewhere in between, you know, 10 to 12%. And again, one of the things I think that, you know, this kind of in this moment you realize is that, you know, the alcohol beverage industry has been lagging behind because of a lot of regulation. But if this is any kind of evidence that, you know, that might change, we need to all prepare for it. And like, this is the type of thing that we need to figure out, okay, here, it's going to shift. So are we going to have, are we going to have things in place to make that shift? And who's going to have those um, processes and infrastructure in place for, you know, the shift that could possibly happen? I think you're, we don't know yet how big, but I think we know it's going to happen. And I think we need to prepare for it. Here's a, another audience question. Um, I'll throw this to Sam. What advice would you give someone who has worked the last year and a half to open a brewery and still needs to fundraise capital? Um, so my advice would be when you write your business, plan, first of all, write a business plan, even if you don't need money uh, to raise money, because then at least you've got a concise uh, you know, document to refer to on, on your compass of where you're going and secondly as you consider what your business and model will be instead of contemplating because in this in this now challenging moment instead of contemplating how big can can you be and start your business contemplate how small can you be and be uh you know economically uh viable uh so starting small uh and again the the, the, the tasting room model may be under siege in this moment but the, those restrictions will lift and that is a great place to start because you can prove your model in, in a place where you're keeping 100% of the revenue. And let's face it, distributors are inundated with new brands and the tasting rooms are really the farm systems where you can develop a brand before, if you want to, take your game uh, to the majors into distribution and you'll be doing the distributors a favor if you develop your brand voice and what makes it distinct within your own walls before you bring it to them in a world where there's a cacophony of 8,000 brand voices. It, here's another question. In your estimation, did, did more accounts take the proper measures to shut down their draft systems? How will draft quality be affected across the industry with accounts not taking the right steps? Maybe John can start with that. Yeah, we right away, we got our line cleaners in and uh, we followed the BA guidelines. And um, at all of our restaurants, we kept two open. We kept two of our lizard bills open because we uh, opened them just for a special event and <clears throat> ran a bunch of uh, growlers through to get rid of the draft beer that was in there. But yeah, that's a that's a huge concern um, when this reopens because, you know, I've been preaching draft quality and, you know, done seminars at CBC over, you know, over the years. So I understand it, but how are you going to get out there? How's the distributor going to get out there and say, Hey, we got to pull that keg. It's no good. It's not right. Um, because there's thousands of retailers that are going to be in that boat. So it's a really, really hot button topic. I think. Matt, um, the, during this crisis, there has been an increased uh, rate of sale for flagship brands, and this person says that the rate of sale for newer items have stalled or slowed. Do you see this trend continuing? I mean, 
I think that you, you can probably see and what you know kind of Sam said first it's like people in the time of crisis go to you know the brands that are comfortable with and the brands they know they're going to be there for them um so I think you know during the current state when we have this shelter in place stay at home and where we're you know obviously not um where we were and even a month ago I think you're probably going to see a little bit more of that um that doesn't mean that there aren't going to be customers out there wanting newness and wanting trial and I think you just got to kind of balance that knowing that you know maybe if in the past your new items you know you sold say 500 cases say in a total wine uh, market you know at this point maybe you need to say well maybe that's 300 and maybe my tried and true which could be there are tried and true locals right that people go to um you know maybe that's what i need to focus on you know and make sure that you know the supply chain there is in the production there is able to support it so i do think it's going to be a little bit of um you know it's not going to be like it has been currently but i don't see why i wouldn't bounce back just like we're hoping everything's kind of going to bounce back you know as we look at how fast we get back to uh the the norm what the new normal i keep saying I'm getting the cue to wrap up here. So I want to hit you all with one lightning round question. And it's one that you're not going to have the, the right answer to probably. Uh, but I want you to look in your crystal ball a year from now. What does this industry look like? We'll start with Sam. 12 months from now. Yep. What does this industry look like? I think uh, to be realistic, I would think that uh, on-premise has now gone back to a, a trend of of growth and back to some semblance of normalcy but frankly i don't think we should think that it'd be all the way uh to normal uh from there um i would say that you know, being realistic there may be fewer mid-sized craft breweries that relied on distribution uh for their uh for the majority of their sales but i do think the smaller tap room model is going to be very very strong and the large largest sort of 100 plus uh top 100 plus will be in a safe place and you know on the wall behind me is a bunch of our our co-workers what i do have confidence is that in 12 months from now we'll have all of our co-workers uh moving in the same direction to help our industry uh get back to growth shoulder to shoulder with all the other craft brewers and their co-workers that are out there Matt, real fast, what does the industry look like in a year? I think it's going to be one that relies more on a digital uh, channel approach, not only just for getting the word out there of the brand like it is now, but I think it's going to be more of a functional digital um, process as well. I, we'll see, but I think that's what's, what's going to happen with when, the experimentation that we're doing now. John, what does the restaurant industry look like in a year? I think... Um... Realistically, 25% restaurants are going to go down after this right off the bat. But I think uh, hyper local is going to be accentuated. So the local guys are going to uh, win out even more. I think some of the regional, the, the national regional chains are going to get their butt kicked. And I feel sorry for the fine dining guys because I don't, I don't, I think that's going to take a while to come back. Julie, bring us home. What, what did we look like in a year? I'm not going to answer that question. What I'm going to say is call your legislators and ask them to do things for you that you need. Everyone needs to explain what help you need. You know what help you need. Call your legislators, federal, state, local, every single one of them and ask for the help you need. See, that's a better, better answer than I could have hoped for. I'm voting for. <laughs> you're, running, you're running Montgomery County. I'm voting. Vote for Julie. Oh my God. Julie, Sam, Matt, John, thank you for doing this panel. Uh, everyone out there, thank you for tuning in. Stay there though. Uh, we will be back in about five minutes uh, or so with the heads from the Brewers Association, the NBWA and the Beer Institute. I need to grab a beer and probably uh, keep my dog entertained. So stick around, we'll be right back.
Brew Talks. Uh, I am Justin Kindle, the editor of Brewbound, and we are still talking about how the COVID-19 outbreak is affecting the beer industry and how the industry is navigating it. And our next pet panel features three men who, along with their organizations, have worked hard to build up this industry to $328 billion in economic activity and what was 70,000 direct jobs and 2.1 million overall jobs, according to the last Beer Serves America report. And in a matter of weeks, we have seen the industry take a major hit. And we're going to talk about it with the three leaders from the trade groups. They're going to give you a feel for how their constituencies have been affected. Joining us now are Bob Pease, the president and CEO of the Brewers Association. Bob, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Justin. Great to be here. Thanks for the opportunity and thanks to Brewbound for uh, bringing, bringing the community together and certainly a shout out to Sam Dogfish Head for, for supporting, for supporting Brew Talks. We've also got Craig Purser, the president and CEO of the National Beer Wholesalers Association. Craig, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Justin. I'm looking forward to a good conversation. Uh, it's terrific to be together. You know, this industry is all about the people. And what do we do when we can't be together? We improvise. Well, we were supposed to be at your legislative conference right now. So, as, as a matter of fact, we were supposed to be at our legislative conference. We were supposed to have our cheers beer and food event with uh, all of our friends on Capitol Hill. And we were supposed to be at opening day of the World Series Washington Nationals, uh, but that got interrupted as well. And also joining us is Jim McGreedy, the president and CEO of the Beer Institute. Jim, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Justin. Thanks. It's great to be here. Um, thanks to you for putting this on. Thanks to Sam and others for sponsoring it. Um, I think it's really important for the three of us as the three trade association CEOs to be together, to talk to you, to talk to so many people, 900 plus people at this moment um, about these issues. The, the beer business has been turned upside down in the last uh, three weeks and likely will uh, continue to be uh, turned upside down for the next several weeks or months. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. And I'm super glad to be with my counterparts at the Brewers Association and the wholesalers. Well, I really appreciate you three taking the time out because I know you're super busy with trying to keep everything afloat in the industry. And I, I'd like to get a perspective from each of you on how your respective constituencies have been affected and the kind of phone conversations that you guys have been having over the past week. How, how are your constituencies doing? You know, what are you hearing from your members? What, what do they need the most right now? And I'll start with you, Bob. Thanks, Justin. Um, you know, for the Brewers Association, who represents the small and independent craft brewing community, uh, the impacts of COVID-19 have been, you know, in a word, devastating. 71%, uh, let me back up, it's, there's, there's over eight, just a little over 8,000 breweries in the United States right now, right, including large brewers, small brewers, brew pubs, tap rooms. 71% of those, of those 8,000 8, breweries are brew pubs and tap rooms. So a little over, a little over 5,800 breweries, brew pubs or tap rooms. The impact on them has been simply one of, you know, chaos. Uh, their ability to do on-premise uh, sales is down, uh, you know, over 85%. And uh, they are trying to they are trying to weather the storm the best they can um, until we until we come out of the pandemic. Um, you know we've done we've done some good surveying through our chief economist Bart Watson, and you know every brewer that's responded has seen a significant decline in their business. Uh, if this lasts, if, the, if this lasts a month six weeks, then many of them, I think, will be able to survive. But if this goes two months, four months, six months, then um, the, there's going to be a significant toll. Um, we've, uh, we've asked our members, uh, you know, how many, uh, how many of them are looking at potential layoffs? Uh, we're looking at over 60% of our, of our membership 
responded to that survey indicating they're going to have to lay people lay people off and you know so this is right coming on the heels of when we usually we we release our industry impact numbers with uh, regards to uh, you know the uh, the impact on craft and the American economy and and on the beer community and we're you know we're poised to say you know the fort craft is 14% of the market by volume 25% of the market by dollars we increased our job, our direct job count by over 10,000. So 160,000 Americans employed at, you know, either production craft breweries, brew pubs, or tap rooms. And now this has all kind of come to a screeching halt. Jim, what are you hearing from Beer Institute members? You know, I spoke to a small brewer in our membership last week, Justin, uh, who told me that every day pre presents a new set of challenges for. Uh, for him just to keep the doors open. And I've been hearing that from a lot of brewers of all different sizes. Um, I think Sam said uh, in your earlier panel that uh, he's trying to stay in the moment in terms of dealing with issues and uh, spending some time thinking about the future, but uh, really more trying to stay in the moment. And I, I, I feel like a lot of brewers to do that, but distributors are trying to do the same, sort of deal with the issues that are put in front of them uh, every day, uh, but then also trying to figure out how, uh, how the uh, policy space can help them uh, achieve what they need to, to achieve to keep the doors open. So we've been spending a lot of time talking to brewers uh, in our membership, uh, talking to Bob, talking to Craig, trying to figure out ways that we could work uh, with them, and work with others in the food and beverage space uh, to help our members. Uh, for us at the Beer Institute really, we're taking a threefold approach to what we're doing these days. We're, we're trying to figure out how we can help uh, uh, through policy initiatives on the, on the federal level. We saw phase three last week. We'll see phase four coming here in the next few weeks. How we can help our members and the industry uh, keep going uh, by using federal policy. How we really can collaborate with um, uh, these two great organizations that are on the panel with, uh, with us now. Uh, along with how we can work with the food and beverage industry at large um, uh, to uh, remain essential, to figure out issues uh, that come up uh, every day. And then the third way really is to be a resource for our members through um, weekly conference calls, weekly webinars, um, and information sharing that we can do to show, to tell people what's happening in Washington, D.C. But, you know, I've been talking to members uh, really for the last two and a half weeks. Um, and they're really trying to figure out what every day brings while trying to see what uh, the future brings. The problem is we don't know how long this is gonna last, as Bob said. Uh, if it's uh, two or three weeks, then uh, you know maybe we can survive. If it's any longer, um, uh, it, it gets more difficult. So I think staying in the moment, uh, figuring out the ways that uh, the trade associations can work together to help the industry is super important. Craig, what's the word from NBWA members right now? Well, you know, really for the first two or two weeks or so, one of the things that we were all working on together was the whole notion of making sure that the, the regular, at least the off-premise channels were serviced. And that means getting, getting our industry included as, as what was defined as essential. And that was done just about two weeks ago by the Department of Homeland Security, and we got some guidance along those lines. We saw two areas where uh, our members could be relevant. One was in the transportation space, and the other was in the agriculture space. And so we were very pleased to see that kind of as a, as a first objective of the association. The thought is, if, if uh, we don't have folks in breweries making beer, and we don't have folks being able to get the beer on retail shelves, when, this, isn't gonna, this isn't gonna be helpful at all even though there's been such displacement and such, such disruption uh, for so many brewers specifically and so many independent retailers. Um, when you take 20% of the account base of the beer industry and you close it, that's unbelievable. But even preceding that, we had a real problem uh, as it relates to this was really the, the worst time in the beer calendar for this, this kind of uh, of shock to occur to the system. We had beer that was positioned all over the country uh, for all the spring events, St. Patrick's Day, March Madness, opening day for baseball, uh, all of the pro sports leagues. 
uh, all of the spring activities and college campuses and, and uh, marketplaces that love to celebrate what's going on in the, uh, with, with the spring of the year, you had this just horrible dynamic. And, and so kind of our second objective was to be sure that we had the opportunity for as much inventory to be moved around as could. And we were pleased to see TTB step in very quickly with some guidance, at least from the federal level, about folks being able to reposition beer products. So that was very positive. And then, the, then our third objective is, has really been around providing that assistance, support, sharing best practices, constantly communicating with our members. But the reality is, this is, this is unprecedented. This is really, really difficult. Uh, we had our first fatality from COVID-19 late last week in New York City, uh, as we saw the first casualty, at least that I'm aware of, in the beer industry in the form of a 40-something-year-old of a, a, a uh, professional from Manhattan Beers. And when you have that kind of, uh, and, I, and I don't think this is going to be the last fatality that affects our industry, but it really helps bring it home and it puts in perspective uh, how serious uh, this, this challenge is that's in front of us. Absolutely. I, I have a friend in who lives in Madrid, Iowa, my hometown, and I got the message yesterday that he was in the hospital. He's on oxygen and he's hopefully on, on the mend. But it, I, this this disease is going to touch everyone. There's just no question about it in some way. Like you're going to know somebody you're going to hear about somebody. It, it's going to touch everybody that we know. So I, and I, I, I guess. I want to jump off of what you just talked about too, Craig, is the timing of this and, and how, how bad that is. And, and you, you did a great job of breaking that down. You know, we've, we've lot, there's a lot of sacrifice that has gone on here. And I think everyone can probably agree that shutting down the on-premise and own-premise was the right thing to do to stop the spread, bend the curve, and not overwhelm the healthcare system. But it comes with sacrifice. And, and you mentioned you ticked it off it and NBA and NHL games March Madness opening day and MLB games uh, the arena sales alone lost in this uh, have to be massive let alone what, what someone like Buffalo Wild Wings which is the largest pour of draft beer in the US what they lost and then you add on to that the loss of St. Patrick's Day sales um, mostly uh, I some things still went on, unfortunately, but, you know, the, the vast majority of those events got canceled. So uh, I, I would ask you, Craig, and, and then Jim, uh, do you have an indication of just the amount of potential sales that this industry has sacrificed? I, I don't think we're going to have that number uh, for a little bit of time because, um, you, you know, the, the, this this was was met with just a gigantic shift from the on premise to the off. Uh, we saw pantry loading like we've not seen in our lifetimes. We saw uh, a couple of weeks that were unbelievable as it relates to a wide variety of brands, brands that haven't seen growth for years, that all of a sudden um, saw people going and and pulling a big format uh, of that product because. You know, that's what folks do when they're planning for, you know, to be sequestered or be, you know, in, in this case, quarantined, um, you know, they, they go for a value pack, perhaps, or they go for more volume for the short term. So I, I don't think we have those numbers crunched, but they're staggering. And they're also, you know, they're, they're um, you know, I, I think it's so important as advocates in this industry that we also recognize that we're, this is not just us. I mean, this is everybody, not just in our nation and in our economy, but on our planet. So all of these businesses have been interrupted. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether you sell automobiles uh, or you, you are a dental hygienist. You, you probably didn't work uh, for the last two weeks. And that kind of cross-section has an amazing impact on the American economy. And we've got to be very, very thoughtful uh, as it relates to how we advocate around those losses. Jim, uh, we've seen three relief packages pass so far, and we're likely to see a fourth. And I'm, I'm going to guess that there's going to be a fifth and possibly more after that. Um, what further relief would you like to see in the, in the next aid package? 
You know, I think uh, uh, just to answer, partially answer your other question, it's unclear to, to us at this moment how to quantify or what the, what the impact is on, on beer generally. Uh, we obviously see a huge, as Craig said, a huge uh, increase in the off-premise, uh, which is helping uh, many people stay in business. Um, uh, but we also have a great amount of uh, expired, unmerchantable beer at this point. So uh, I think one of the things that's very important, one of the things that Julie brought up in the last segment um, was to do something uh, federal, uh, do something policy-wise about, about all of that unmerchantable beer. So um, a tax credit uh, has been proposed by all three of us. We were working on that. Um, certainly, we don't know... Um, every jot and tittle about how we can get that uh, into phase four, but I think that's certainly uh, very important for us to all be working on in phase four. But I think what Craig said is also very important for us to all recognize. You know, this is, this is affecting every aspect of American life. Um, uh, uh, we need to be sensitive as advocates to, um, to what that uh, means uh, for us when we're going to talk to folks. We need to be reasonable about what it is that we're asking for. Um, certainly, a tax credit of some kind is very reasonable for us to ask for. We also saw uh, for brewers yesterday the TTB uh, defer excise tax payments uh, uh, for three months, another seemingly very reasonable thing in our view um, that, that, could, that could need to be extended for another three months. So I think um, we... Uh, we definitely have certain things that we should be looking for in a phase four bill. Um, uh, phase three was about economic stimulus. Uh, there, there was always a sense that phase four would be about helping specific industries. Um, we, we remain essential as, uh, as a part of the, the American grocery system. Very important to continue to remain essential as well. So I think we can never really take our eye off the ball of keeping that essential designation. We have seen in other countries, some very close to our borders, um, what that means when you are deemed not essential. So keeping our essential uh, designation, uh, working on very specific issues in phase four, uh, but also at the same time, continuing to monitor and listen and communicate to our members about what they're looking for, because we're hearing of new issues every day that we need to think about a policy solution for. Bob, I, I'd ask you the same question. What, what are the biggest needs for small and independent craft brewers right now in, in a potential fourth bill? Well, as Craig and Jim have referenced, you know, we're united on seeking the, the tax credit for out of code uh, draft beer in the market. You know, as we all know, small and independent brewers over index at on premise, uh, retail on draft. So this is a critical issue for, for many of my members. Uh, so we're hopeful that, uh, you know, we can join and present ourselves as a unified front and, you know, keep in mind that, you know, it's not just the brewing industry, but it's also the hospitality industry. And that, you know, want to make sure that in all of our messaging that we are incorporating the impact on the retail tier. Uh, it's got to be all three tiers as, as we advocate for our respective priorities, uh, supplier tier, distributor tier, and retailer tier, uh, because we need those retailers to be there. When, uh, when we come out of this. And uh, certainly there's a concern from our end that a lot of them won't be. Uh, specifically on phase four asks uh, a suspension or waiver of federal excise tax payments through end of 2020 or even 2021. Uh, draft Beverage Modernization Tax Reform Act permanency uh, would also be on our short list of priorities. Uh, this, is a, this is a good time. I, I don't think they want to, the government wants to be letting the current rates expire at, given the current economic situation. Uh, if we can get it, if we can't get excise taxes waived and we could get a deferral, then uh, the repayment needs to be very incremental and very slow. Uh, those payroll protection loans that are in the CARES Act, PPP, very important. We need to continue uh, to have those. We'd like to keep see those forgiven. Um, love to see prevent unemployment insurance rates from increasing due to COVID. You know, we don't know what's around the next corner. Uh, we could come out of this in a couple of months and then a lot of the information that I'm reading indicates that we're gonna have another wave of, uh, of the virus in, in the fall and in the early winter. And until there's a vaccine, you know, we could be on an up and down, we could be on an elevator going up and down. Uh, so all of these things, uh, super important to us. 
uh, as we, uh, you know, we're up on the hill every day, uh, you know, delivering our message to congressional champions who absolutely want to help uh, the beer industry, small and independent brewers. They understand the economic impact that our businesses, our members have to every state, every community, virtually every congressional district in this country. I want to remind our viewers to, you can send us questions, ask at brewbound.com. That's ask at brewbound.com. Or you can text us 617-336-8560, 617-336-8560. Um, one of the things that you guys mentioned is you, you being sympathetic or, or at least realizing that, you know, there are, everyone's asking for assistance at this point. And that's one question that I, I wanted to fire at you, Jim, um, with so many industries in need of relief right now, how challenging is it to get lawmakers attention right now? Gosh, Justin, we have seen at really at all levels of government, federal, state, and local, we have seen policymakers who want to help us. They want to help beer. Uh, they know the, the numbers that Bob uh, talks about for for uh, craft brewing and for the, the beer industry in general in the United States. You, you mentioned them earlier, uh, $328 billion in economic activity. Um, so I, I think, I, at least I have found, and my team has found, a, a very open door and very wide ears listening to what we need. Um, so, I, I, you know, you have, to, you have to sort of get in the, the give and take and the hurly-burly of the uh, legislative process, and we as advocates have to watch what's happening and uh, uh, figure out how we want to position ourselves, and then react to the changing environment. But I, I do find I do find policymakers up and down the chain uh, very interested in helping beer. Bob, you you mentioned the 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 uh, the efforts with the TTB, and just the other day uh, they postponed tax payments and filing deadlines, and you sent a, a letter asking them to waive penalties for excise tax filings and and, and payments for businesses impacted by COVID nineteen. Um, uh, how how difficult or how big of an ask, I guess, is that waiver uh, for, at, at the very least, the length of the force shutdowns? You know, anything, Justin, that's going to put uh, cash back into the pockets of small and independent brewers right now is critical. Uh, one of the things that you asked early on is, you know, what do our members need? Well, when we were, you know, first navigating this labyrinth two weeks ago, you know, the first number one answer that everybody, all of our members got back to us with was, we need a cash infusion. We need something that allows us to pay our rent, to meet payroll, so we don't have to lay off our workers or, you know, go into arrears with our landlord. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's one element of that answer. Uh, the other element I would say is I, I certainly want to give a shout out to uh, Mary Ryan, uh, acting administrator at the TTB and uh, everyone on her team for their responsiveness. Uh, you know, there is, they're, un they're under the gun and they're being deluged just like all of we are, but they have been very responsive to the Brewers Association. And yeah, I would say that's the first time in my career that we sent in a letter on Tuesday and we got an answer on Thursday. Uh, you know, so uh, I think it's just an example of how everybody's trying to, to get in the boat together, row in the same direction and work together. Um, there are there are regulator, but uh, they're not the enemy, and they are working with us. And uh, you know, we were just really pleased to see that that response come in so quickly. Craig, uh, you you've really hammered home, and, and Jim, you've hammered home the the point about beer, the beer industry being considered essential and, and maintaining that designation. And our friends at Beer Business Daily reported today that that. There's some question or, you know, in Mexico, whether that's going to be the case for their brewing industry. Um, do you envision a scenario where that could happen here? Well, I, 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 I don't want to go back in time and, and try to, you know, pr predict that. And I will tell you, you know, we were very um, strategic in the way that we advocated around getting that essential designation. At first weekend that this 
uh, issue kind of came to, to rise, which would have been a, the weekend of about the, uh, the 13th, 14th of, of March, just less than three weeks ago, uh, that we were all communicating with one another and beginning to feel, oh my goodness, there is going to be some federal restriction on we're going. We're beginning to see some local jurisdictions uh, take some matters in their own hands. We were seeing governors, I think, truly lead, and, and they're probably going to be viewed as, as uh, doing a, an awful lot to mitigate some of the spread of this uh, from a health standpoint. But we began to see this necessity uh, that, would, that would eventually come out, and we knew it would be the Department of Homeland Security that would be offering some guidance on what businesses were deemed essential. And one of the things we did was we worked with our state associations, Mahins, to arm them with many very and different talking points depending on who the constituency was. Uh, if it was a public health official that they were interfacing with, there was a different, um, you know, all these were, were, were complimentary messages, uh, but it might've been different than a law enforcement message. It might've been different than someone, uh, you know, from the governor's office. And so we kind of had this as a, as a very quick objective. And I had calls back from other industry partners and, and Jim and I were on the phone late one night with some industry partners outside of alcohol. And they said, well, what, why, why don't we just say it? Why don't we just say alcohol or beer? And our thought was, no, because the minute that you raise that attention, you, you have a different kind of conversation. So as we look at what Mexico's doing, and you know, it, it does appear to be at least this earliest version of this order, um, at least the retail trade is, is posting signs saying that, that distribution and manufacture is not essential. Obviously, that means retail as well. Uh, I saw some video from the marketplace. Lines are forming. Um, lines of cars that that look look like uh, you know fuel, the fuel crisis of the 1970s. Uh, people waiting in line to buy beer. Same thing inside the beer stores. Um, but I do I do know that our our partners and the folks that are working on this are working very hard to turn that order around. And I always remind people when you're dealing with government officials or somebody on the other side always give them the opportunity to change their mind and turn around. Uh, I think that, you know, this is not a very well thought plan. Um, I know that Mexico is dealing with a lot of different uh, issues, uh, but I know those of us on, on behalf of, of distributors, retailers, and consumers of a number of those fine uh, products, uh, you know, they're, they're interested in having those, uh, you know, being produced so that we can get those products back to market. Jim, what does the beer industry need to do to reinforce that notion of essential? Um, I think we definitely need to make sure that we put the beer in the context of American manufacturing and American grocery. We are very important to the market basket in grocery stores, in convenience stores, in all types of, in all types of uh, stores around the country. We are part of American manufacturing. I think that is an important thing for us to be talking about. It's important for us to be talking about we are part of American agriculture, um, and there are other groups in uh, the manufacturing, agriculture, food and beverage sector who understand the importance of beer uh, uh, being produced and distributed and sold. Um, so I think keeping that essential designation comes from showing our value to those people, showing our value to policymakers up and down the line from the uh, from congressmen to folks at TTB to uh, uh, members of state legislatures and um, uh, local city councils. So we, we constantly have to be talking about how we fit into the American scene in terms of who we are as an industry. And I think that's gonna help us continue to uh, have this essential designation. I think we also, as essential, have to be thinking about um, uh, how to keep our workers safe inside the production uh, uh, facilities and inside the, inside the distribution warehouses. So this idea of PPE that uh, folks need uh, is becoming a more and more prevalent discussion, I, I think, inside beer. Um, so um, we have to continually um, change with the discussion that's happening around the, the disease, um, but also make sure we are firmly planted uh, inside the American landscape in terms of manufacturing, agriculture, and grocery. Bob, Justin, just, if I could, I'd jump in there real quick and certainly echo everything that uh, 
my colleagues have said, but a message that's worked for us with uh, state and local regulators on this issue is that beer is food. And uh, I think that that's a message that is easy to understand and it drives, it, it's easy to drive home. Uh, for us, we found that, you know, most state and local governments, I, I never heard of this agency before we started down this road, but the uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, uh, that's a federal agency that held that all food manufacturing, distribution, and retailing constitutes an essential service. So we've been able to push out that message to our state guild leaders. We can then go to take that to their state, their state officials or local officials and point to that along with the notification from the Homeland Security Office and Homeland Security Agency that, yeah, manufact beer, food manufacturing is essential, beer is food, and we've been able to make some positive inroads on that. Uh, you know, you, we've been able to assist in a few cases uh, where, you know, you've got state jurisdictions, local jurisdictions kind of contradicting each other. Uh, certainly, I'm sure some of you guys saw the, uh, the instance in Denver where for initially the mayor ruled that, uh, you know, uh, retail, uh, off-premise retail, not essential, and they were gonna close, you know, all the, all the, the locations that serve, that sold beer off-premise. And, you know, there was a, there was a minor riot uh, for, uh, you know, for a short period of time. Uh, we were able to get some of this information from CISA and from Homeland Security into the hands of the Colorado Brewers Guild, who in turn was able to get that to their, their contacts in the mayor's office and cooler heads prevailed and uh, onward we go and with uh, being part of, uh, being deemed an, an essential service, service to the American food and beverage consumer. We're getting some audience questions in here. Um, uh, on that, that uh, essential business designation, someone wants to know if deemed non-essential and alcohol sales ceased, would this essentially be a de facto prohibition? I'll, I'll go to you, Craig. Yeah, I, I don't know if we want to use those words. I mean, you know, the whole notion of public health and safety uh, really is important. And I think that's one thing we've got to keep in mind when I talk about serious and I talk about sensitive and I talk about sober. I really mean, I mean it. I mean, you know, we, we don't know what the circumstances could look like. And we've got to re maintain respect for these policymakers that are making these calls in very difficult situations. But the whole idea is, you know, when, when we're making the case for being essential, you know, the part of part of the wonderful thing about beer is it, it does bring people together. And even if we can't physically come together, it, it, it is a shared experience. It is something that uh, unites us as a celebration. And, and as difficult as the next few weeks are going to be, we're going to need as much normalcy as we possibly can have. And so I think um, reminding folks that that uh, ability to enjoy a beer after a, a long, hard day of whatever it is that you may be doing has never been more important. I participated in something I never thought I'd do last Friday night. I had a, a, uh, a Zoom happy hour with uh, 10 of my fraternity brothers from 30 plus years ago at the University of Oklahoma. And I tell you, it, it was very unusual. You know, there's a lot of tension uh, of the folks that were uh, assembled in the, in the Zoom room. Uh, nobody had, had lost their job but everybody's company were, were in the process of making big, big cuts. Um, I, I'm afraid in two weeks when we do the next one of those, that's not gonna be the case. So I mention that because um, I don't think um, these, these policy decisions, should alcohol be determined to be not essential, we, don't, we, don't, we shouldn't go there. We need to recognize uh, how serious this is and, and use it in a respectful way. Um, you know, another argument as it relates to this is, you know, uh, you, you, you started, uh, Justin, by talking about the 70,000 folks that are directly employed in the brewing industry. Well, in the distribution industry, it's 142,000 people. And so that whole argument and that, that whole reminder of jobs and the reminder that this industry at large puts a lot of groceries on everybody's table every single week it has to be something that we lead with as well. We're getting a question for clarification on the expired beer tax credit um, for out of code beer. 
are, are you talking about the crediting out the value of the keg beer or are we talking excise tax on the keg beer? So, so the essential, the, the, the earliest thought around this and the letter that we put down and shared with the Speaker of the House and with the Majority Leader of the Senate together, all three organizations uh, accompanied by America's Beverage Licensees, that's the organization that represents both the on and the off-premise retailers, talked about the idea of being able to take a credit based on the value of the product of whoever was holding the product when it, when it codes, when it expires. And the idea is we're all going to be working together for the next number of weeks and month, months to get this product, uh, you know, uh, accounted for. Uh, obviously, if it's draft beer, uh, there, there may be an opportunity to repurpose that. Um, we, I've been thrilled to see a number of leading brewers talk about sharing that burden with distribution. As distributors are, we're legal taking that product back. That's an awesome, awesome reminder of how great this industry. A number of folks have, have announced that they're going 50-50 split, some of them better as it relates to that expiring beer. But the idea behind the policy proposal is to provide the holder of that inventory with a credit for the value of that product. It's not going to do anything except for perhaps keep more people uh, employed. If you're a small brewer and you have 10 or 20 or $30,000 worth of beer in inventory, if you're able to declare that as a credit, you can take that credit to the bank and perhaps keep your doors open. If you're a distributor and, and it's you know as much as a million dollars in inventory, you're going to be able to do the same thing and keep more people on your payroll. And obviously, if you're a retailer, and you know some of these retailers, depending on the jurisdiction, depending on whether they're a venue or whether they're a, a mom and pop bar on the corner, have thousands and tens of thousands, and in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars of inventory that are sitting there that, that because the jurisdiction closed the account, can't safely get to that product. This is an idea, and it's a it's a proposal that would allow everybody that's that's sharing in this burden to share in the relief. Bob, uh, I want to hit on this because we we are going to be running short on time. But if we would have talked in probably early January and we would have talked about the best way to open a craft brewery, I think we both would have agreed the best way would have been to open a taproom model, sell within your four walls directly to the consumer and just build your business and your brand that way before you even consider going out to distribution. And in a matter of a couple of weeks in March, uh, that model seemingly got thrown on its head. How would you even advise uh, someone who is looking to open a small brewery at this point? Well, when we come out of all of this, Justin, you know there's going to be young women and men entrepreneurs that want to start a small and independent craft brewery. And you know the Brewers Association will be there for them with business critical resources, just like we've been through all of this for our existing members. What we would tell those, what we would tell those prospective brewery owners or brewery members is, uh, you know, one, you got to make sure that you're well capitalized and that you have the ability, you know, that you have six to 12 months of cash flow uh, at your disposal, uh, given that, you know, who knows what's, who, who knows what's lurking around the corner. Uh, I think you got to recognize that today's beer market is not going to be the beer market in six, uh, the beer market in six months or five years from now. That this is a very dynamic industry, very dynamic community. It's changing very quickly, um, but there's going to be room for for new entrants into the market once once the dust settles. Uh, but for us, and you know, right, we're focused on at the Brewers Association right now again is, you know, delivering business critical resources to our members who are just thirsty for, for this information. Uh, you know, we did a, a power hour yesterday, or maybe it was, I can't, the days all blur together, but, uh, you know, when uh, a leading attorney uh, gave a seminar on how do you, you know, best access all of the resources for small business owners and hospitality owners from the CARES Act. And we had 1,700 people participate in that power hour, kind of like I think the numbers that you're seeing here for Brew Talks, we had never seen anything like that. We had to shift our platform like on the dime to be able to accommodate all of those people. 
out uh, the number of visitors we're getting to our, our COVID-19 resource center on brewersassociation.org is through the roof. We're seeing uh, traffic like you would not, you would not believe. Uh, and we're delivering resources to them like, you know, just on the fly, our technical committee was able to put together a resource, how to, how to, shut, down, how to shut down your draft system for an extended period and uh, saw record traffic for that. Uh, now we're coming up with a new resource that we just launched, I think yesterday, and how to, re how to restart your draft system when, uh, and you know, trying to put some positive information out there as well. So that's what we're gonna continue to do with the BA. And, uh, but uh, it's gonna be, uh, it, the, future, the future is going to be interesting for sure. And again, I think it all depends on how long this lasts, but you know, every indicator that I see now is this is longer, not shorter. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I, I a hundred percent agree with you until we have a vaccine, everything is uncertain until that point. And we are likely to see ebbs and flows until that happens. Um, we're, we're getting a bunch of uh, audience questions about this with all the relaxation of three tier regulations against the, across the U S do you feel that these will quickly revert back to the way it was once this is passed, or do you think that the consumer will want or even demand these changes to stay in place? And I, I guess I'd start with you, Craig. Well, it, I think some of this depends. I mean, one of the things that we've seen that's been, uh, you know, an immediate from a retail standpoint has been the, the to-go sales in the, uh, in the uh, what previously is the on-premise channels. Uh, I got a, a chicken sandwich I snuck into the office today. Um, we've been working remotely, I think, like most have for well over two weeks. Um, but uh, this this is a relatively new restaurant, and we want to see them succeed. But um, I was there, and I was able to pick up four chicken sandwiches, and both draft beer and packaged beer to go. And um, you know, I, I think that that is one of those things that uh, the consumer is going to you know they're going to see value in, but depending on that price and depending on how that product is sold, um, I don't know whether that's going to you know, continue to be something that the consumer is going to do in a big way or not. I'm amazed at how many of these restaurants have been able or, and have chosen to make a go of it, um, you know, changing their format completely. Um, I do think that we're seeing, um, you know, obviously the whole notion of moving product around is, is good for convenience and the whole notion of uh, being able to reposition uh, to meet customers' needs and take what was pre uh, in the on and, and provided in the off, all was very important for this. But this, this system and this way that it was, I think that we remember that the way that it was is what gave rise to nearly 10,000 brewers. And that's astonishing. I mean, um, you know, my, my, my cohort compadres here have heard me say this so many times they can re recite it with me. But, you know, in 1983, there were fewer than 50 breweries in the whole United States. And you look at where we are today, whether it's 7,000, whether it's 8,000, that's an American success story. And that, that, was, that was built against a good backdrop of effective state regulation uh, and important federal regulation, likewise, that kept the largest manufacturers from dictating terms. Um, you know, uh, one of the issues that's getting attention lately is the whole notion of, of credit and items of value to retail. Everyone needs to think long and hard about what that looks like if the largest manufacturers are able to go in and bankroll retailers and bring us back to a tight house. And, and um, so I, I, I urge caution. I think some of these... Uh, um, uh, for these convenience items, I think certainly the, the whole notion of home delivery is getting a, uh, you know, real-time kind of shot in the arm boost. People that have not utilized those services before are doing so in record numbers. Uh, but there is a way to do this, and there's a way to do this that maintains the integrity for everybody that's involved. Uh, Bob, I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, I will respectfully uh, disagree for my, with my esteemed colleague from the state of Virginia that the current regulatory system is what gave rise to 8,000 small and independent breweries. Come on, 
what gave rise to that 8,000 small and independent breweries is the entrepreneurial spirit of young men and women who wanted to start something of meaning. Okay, and then that, then that, then that rise was fueled by the beer drinker. That's what happened. That's why there's 8,000 breweries. Now we certainly support three-tier system, but Greg has heard me say this ad nauseum. It should be, it should not be a straitjacket. It should be an evolving doctrine. And this, this, these events of the last three weeks or maybe three months are really going to call into question the existing regulatory system. If breweries, if 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 people can't, if the beer drinker can't go to the brewery, the brewery is going to have to find a way to go to the beer drinker. And right now we're seeing, you know, states and municipalities relax regulation to allow small businesses to stay afloat through home delivery. Uh, and we don't think the sky is falling. Certainly a very small sample early on, but I think, you know, there's going to be, a, there's going to be some type of reset coming out of all of this. I think Justin, there could be a reset. Justin, quick. Yep. Justin, go ahead. You want to jump in? This is Jim. Um, Yes, uh, I, I'd like to hearken back to something, two things Sam Calgione said at the, in the first panel. The first was that uh, he's got a act, he's got a vibrant restaurant uh, uh, business going on in his, uh, in his locations in Delaware. Uh, but he said 99% of what we sell comes through the three tier system. And he also said that it was very important for brewers to stay in the moment. Um, and I think this is a good example of staying in the moment. So we don't know what the future is going to bring. Um, I think you just saw a very good example of uh, the dynamism of the of viewpoints and um, policy positions in the beer business. Uh, but it's important for us to kind of stay in the moment and to collaborate on what we can do in front of us. So nobody's got a crystal ball. Certainly things will change uh, or attempts will be made to change some some things um but i think at this moment uh focusing on phase four phase five phase six um and then maybe debating these things uh, down the line would be the best way to go but it was fun to watch that <laughs> it was absolutely fun and that's why i want to want to ask maybe you know once we do get out of this there's an opportunity to refocus you know for the wholesaler on potentially, you know, larger, higher volume brands. And there's some give there as well for the smaller brewer to, you know, deliver directly or maybe ship to the consumer, which I've seen some brewers like Jester King advocate for. Saw that, saw that today. And so I, I, I wonder, you know, what, what becomes on the table? And because I, I think there was even a good beer hunting report the other day that some wholesalers are even you know deciding which brands they want to focus on at this moment and some of those are just larger higher volume brands as we see this stock up go on i'd ask you what your thoughts you know, I are talked Craig. To, i talked to a leading um i talked to a small brewer at the beginning of this and and he was he was asking the questions uh, uh, around the whole notion of you know, feeling like he wasn't getting the attention uh, during some of this pantry build. And I asked, I said, tell me about your biggest package. He said, well, I sell, you know, six packs. I said, well, do you sell, you know, do you sell four six packs, you know, in a box and do you have it ready to go like that? And he said, well, no. I said, well, th this may be the time that you should do that. And, you know, I, I think we saw that with, a, with some of this pantry some of these brands during this period are brands that haven't seen growth for a long time. And so I, I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, and, and, and it's regrettable when distributors behave badly. There's no doubt about that. Um, and it's regrettable when folks cut SKUs. I mean, that's, that's, that should never occur. When you take on a brand, you take on a brand and you, and you pledge your best effort. However, I think the, you know, when you look at the success of this system, and this is where, you know, we can we can argue around the edges. We can disagree about better ways to go to market. But when you look at DSD and you look at the beer success of the last three weeks, it's a story that of system of, of product that's been out there to keep all these folks working.
working and all these folks, you know, uh, kind of demonstrating the whole notion of essential services. We don't know what, what uh, you know, the folks in at least my constituent companies may be called to do uh, in the coming weeks or months as it relates to this. We do know that beer distributors know how to get the product from point A to point B and know how to meet the needs of thirsty consumers in any retail venue that you can name. So, um, you know, there's, there's and, and, and Bob used a good word, evolution. This, this system has evolved. You know, direct to consumer sales are allowed in most jurisdictions in one way, shape or form. And a lot of that has been done in concert with the distributors that sell 99% of Sam Caligione's beer. I want to bring this back uh, because we are going to be running short on time here and I want to get through some of these questions. It, um, I, but I, I want you all to sort of play along and look into your crystal ball. Uh, I know it's difficult right now, but what does the on-premise look like when it returns? Uh, what are we going to see? You know, what's a brewery tap room or restaurant look like? You know, what what's the future for how, because this is a social industry, you know, we're supposed to be networking at Craig's event, you know, we're supposed to be going down to CBC with what, 60,000, 30,000 brewers, you know, we're supposed to be going to GABF, we're supposed to be at the Beer Institute's annual meeting in June, you know, in New York, like, what, what, what does the on-premise, you know, what, what does the future of this industry look like in a post-COVID world? I'll start. Uh, I think in a, in a word, uh, different. Um, you know, and when we come out of this initially, I think there's going to be some beer drinkers that are very, you know, anxious to go back to the way things were and will visit on-premise locations as much, if not more, than they used to in an effort to support those local, those local businesses, their local brewery. But I think there's going to be a significant segment of people that are going to want to practice physical or social distancing. So I think on-premise locations are going to be looking at having to reconfigure their spaces uh, and potentially, you know, where you used to see 12 seats at a bar, maybe you see six. Um, you know, some tables, you know, pile on top of each other. Maybe they, they have to reconfigure their physical setting so that they can allow for on-premise consumption, but they still encourage safe physical, physical distancing, social distancing. I think we're going to see two different, uh, you know, stops and starts on this. One pre, one pre-vaccine and one post-vaccine. Um, my hope is that, uh, you know, we'll be able to, uh, to weather the storm before the before the vaccine, and that many many of our member breweries and Craig's distributors and Jim's members can come through this uh, and last till there's a vaccine, and then you know it'll be downhill from there. Uh, we're still hoping to bring the community. One of the things we pride ourselves on at the Brewers Association is we feel we bring we bring people together. One of our phrases is we build communities, and we are very we are still planning and hopeful that we're going to be able to bring the beer industry together in late September at the Great American Beer Festival in Denver. Uh, that's that's what that's our mindset right now. Jim, uh, what's the future look like? I don't know what the future looks like. Um, I hope what the future looks like is a stronger beer industry uh, when this is all over. Um, and I think one of the things, one of the things that underpins uh, that hope is the fact that we all came together uh, last year and uh, this year uh, on the beer growth initiative. You had John Lane from, um, uh, uh, the the from the previous panel. Uh, who was part of something called the Alliance for Beer uh, over the last few years, trying to find ways for everyone in the three tiers to work together uh, to celebrate beer, to improve beer sales. So whatever it is that the future looks like, I hope it includes a, uh, a revived growth initiative plus plus on steroids, really. I mean, we all have to be out there celebrating beer. We all have to be out there promoting beer, and uh, we all have to be out there uh, helping every company sell more beer. So I don't know what the future looks like, but I certainly hope that uh, that's part of the theme of going forward. Craig, where are we in 12 months? Uh, I, think, I think both both Bob and Jim are correct. I think it is going to be different. And I don't think, I think we've got to recognize that if we're going to be 
um, thoughtful leaders, thoughtful advocates, folks that are working to bring the, the industry forward together. It definitely is going to be transformative, what we're dealing with right now. But I do think that um, we have far more things that, that, that uh, unite us than divide us. I think um, I'm optimistic. I'm a beer glasses half full guy, and I am on this as well. Um, you know, beer distributors and brewers are the fabrics of America's communities. And um, I, I am, I'm optimistic about our ability to continue to move the ball forward together. Um, Jim mentioned the whole notion of the Beer Growth Initiative, which has been a, 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 a wild industry success story because we, for the first time, after talking about this for at least the 20 plus years that I've been around, Everybody put their differences aside and put their, their shoulder to the wheel, rolled up their sleeves and pushed. And that kind of framework, I think, is going to, uh, and that kind of working together is going to be a mistake about it. I think the next few weeks are going to be a challenge. I think we're all going to have to lean on each other. We're going to have to, uh, you know, hug our children and our parents a little bit closer. And if we can't do that, uh, physically, because we're not under the same roof, we've got to do that virtually. We've got to communicate with each other like we've never have before. And we've got to keep doing the work that we can to remind people uh, of the greatness of this industry. And the real reason for the greatness of, the, of this industry is because its people are really good. And that's where I have to go. I, I, I appreciate the three of you taking the time out to be here today. You mentioned getting back to work and, and letting the people know how important this industry is. And I need to let you three get back to it. We need to wrap things up here. So thank you, Craig. Thank you, Jim. And thank you, Bob, for being here today. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. We're going to try and do this a little more often in the near future uh, and probably a little less formally, but Look for, for more of this on brewbound.com. Before I wrap, a big thank you to our AV team, to the Brewbound team, Jess Infante and Jeff Kleinman, as well as Selling Craft Beer, Sean McNulty, for all the help with prep, as well as my other industry friends that want to remain nameless. Um, and I, again, just thank you all for tuning in, and stay safe, stay healthy out there, and we'll see you next time.